Well, happy Father's Day, everyone. Welcome to the 8. I'm happy that we're able to celebrate Father's Day together. We're happy to have Abunamina with us celebrating Father's Day. But let me just start with um, on the spirit of Father's Day and on the spirit of lame dad jokes. Not jokes. Actually, this is trivia. So let me just uh, share some trivia questions for you. Let's see who knows these answers. What is the most gifted present that fathers receive on Father's Day? Socks? Bugs? Mugs. I was like, wow, <laughs> I need to talk to your kids. <laughs> oh. What is the most gifted present? Mugs? Tie? That's funny you say mugs. That's what I got my dad. So, dad, I spoiled it for you. You got mugs. So. It's mugs. So. Okay. Uh, what is it? A child? Oh, hey, <laughs> that, that's a big, that's, that's an expensive gift. Uh, <laughs> that can be a gift or not good news, too. I guess. <laughs> so, the most gifted present for fathers is a necktie, necktie, necktie. Um, so at least Sarah doesn't have to worry about getting me that, right, necktie. Okay, name the U.S. president, name the U.S. president who initiated the celebration of Father's Day with a presidential proclamation. Name the, FDR, no. Huh? Kennedy, no, not Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. Okay, last trivia question. Huh? I, I have no idea. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a staff for you. What is the name of Nemo's dad in the 2003 Disney film Finding Nemo? Marlon. Wow, very good, Trevor. No hesitation. Very good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All right. U.S. history, I don't know. But Marlon, I know Marlon. <laughs> All right. The, thir the year 33 AD was a pivotal point in world history, and everyone can agree on that. Because of one singular event in which no one expected death to be overcome, this is what put into motion a Christian worldview and a wide array of derivatives and versions of Christianity that were born because of this one singular event. This one singular event was a redefinition to death itself. Was a redefinition to death itself. Death had a certain meaning. Everyone understood death in a certain way leading up to 33 AD. But when they saw death being overcome, there all of a sudden became a new definition and a new movement internally given a code name being titled The Way. People were beginning to follow the way because they experienced and they saw and they had breakfast and they talked with the personification of the one who redefined death. And this obviously changed world history. All of us can agree on that. Even if you're all into being a Jesus follower, you're questioning things, or you've already made the decision that Christianity is not for you, you're all in the right place. You're all listening to the right talk. But we can all understand, all world history understands that the year 33 AD put a, a, a huge change in the course of world history because many people were first eyewitnesses to a redefinition to death. As I mentioned, there was a wide array of derivatives in different versions of worldviews that were sparked because of the year 33 AD. Not only are there over 33,000 different uh, Protestant versions of Christianity. Not only are there different cults and different sects that have some version of Jesus embedded into the worldview, there's other world religions that were sparked because of the year 33 AD. One of them is Islam. Islam. So Muhammad himself, just historically speaking, he, became, he was part of a family that had Christians in his family and he also had Jews in his family. So in a very creative way, he began to, to, to mold a different worldview by taking both of these ver version, different worldviews of Judaism and Christianity and kind of mixed it all together and began to form a derivative of Christianity. So actually the best way to look at Islam and many other religions is say, how is it a derivative of the version of Christianity that was sparked in the year 33 AD? How is Islam or other worldviews a derivative of the year 33 AD of Christianity? When Christianity was sparked. Obviously, I'm, I'm, this is not a, a Muslim talk, but it, it, to me, it's like super fascinating. If you look at the history of Islam and how it kind of evolved and how it took parts of Christianity, there's other documents of, of Islam called the Hadith, for example. And this, this document uh, 
records supernatural events in which Muhammad did, right? But the, fun, the interesting thing, at least to me, it's, it's interesting, there are no first eyewitnesses who wrote down the hadith. There's no first eyewitnesses to these supernatural events. And if you look at some of these supernatural events in which Muhammad uh, claimed to have done, just as you saw Jesus take five loaves and two fish, or you saw Jesus uh, convert wa water into wine, you see Muhammad take water and convert it into milk, right? So all of a sudden you're seeing a derivative of the original story which tr transformed world history. You're seeing it now evolve and, and, and have a different version of Christianity, but now giving a title of being titled Islam. So you see a wide array of different things that have been sparked and have changed world history all because of the year 33 AD. There was an early Christian scholar by the name of Origen. His name is Origen. I tried to convince my wife to name our future son Origen, but she didn't agree. I think it's a great name, Origen. So he was a philosopher. He was a Christian convert around the year 220. Uh, and actually, he was from Alexandria. So he is Egyptian, but he is an early Christian. And he had to say this about just from a historical perspective. Christians at first were few in number and held the same opinions. So he said in the beginning, if you just look at world history, there was this internal group being sparked by 12 ordinary men and how it grew exponentially. But in that small group, just being titled the way, right? The, the title Christian didn't really t take off from the get-go, right? So they were followers of Jesus. They were being titled, the code name, they were followers of the way. Christians at first were few in number and held the same opinions, right? They held the same bedrock of what it means to be a Jesus follower. So the same r rituals, traditions, the fullness of the church, they all had the same opinion. They all understood it. But when they grew to be a great multitude, they were divided and separated each wishing to have his own individual party. You would think the year is 2022 for, the, for, for, for a, a Christian philosopher in the name of Origen to say something like this. Everyone wanted their own individual party. But this is the year 220 AD, right? We're talking about 180 years, we're talking about 190 years after the resurrection of Jesus. He's talking about in the beginning, there was an understanding of what the fullness of Christianity is. But it naturally evolved because everybody wanted their own version. And, and all of a sudden you began to have a wide array of individual parties. How true is that in our post-Christian America? You do your truth, I do my truth. Everything is relative. Everyone wants their own individual party, right? None of us want to be part of a group. We want to kind of go off because no one else gets me. This is what's best for me. So we're, all, we're having a wide array of different worldviews. And this break of the fullness of Christianity, we're seeing that Origen is documenting this in the year 220 AD. The year 33 AD, all Christians had the same opinion. At 16 years, we're going to look at one of a, a big major issue, drama, that is now happening in people who are Jesus followers. They're starting to be, there's becoming there's starting to become an issue between those who are interested in Jesus being God and flesh. Around this time, there are two main groups of people. You have Jews, which have a, a strong understanding of who God is and how God has worked in humanity. They have the Torah. We, the, the, the Jews have a strong moral code and ethical code in which they pursue God with. Gentiles is the opposite. Gentiles is basically a, a broad term for everyone who is not a Jew. So most Gentiles are worshiping pagan idols, kind of following their own truth, having their own definitions to sexuality, having their own definitions of what worship is. They, they construct their own deity in whom they will worship. So these are the main two groups of people. And the dilemma that's happening in the year 49 AD is a big issue that's happening now in the Christian world. What's the issue that's occurring right now in, this, in, in the tension that's happening in the year 49 AD? The tension is this. There are some Jesus followers that are saying that, that were originally Jews. They're saying, hey, in order for anyone to become a Jesus follower, they have to become a Jew first and then a Gentile. Why? Because Jesus was a Jew. He built upon the foundation of the Judaic worldview. He built upon what God did in the Torah and the Old Testament and the Israelites. And then he came to bring that to completion. He came to give us a new covenant, but the backdrop was the old covenant. So in order for someone to become a Jesus follower, he has to or she has to become a Jew first. And gentlemen, you know what that means. You got to get circumcised if you want to become a Jesus follower. So there was a group of people saying this, and then you have another group saying, 
What? Did you not listen to an, a single thing Jesus said 16 years ago? He never said we have to become a Jew first before we have to become a, a follower of him. There was no, we didn't have to, like, there's no prerequisite in order for us to be all into Jesus. Jesus came to make all things new. Remember that he said that? So there, it doesn't matter your background, your worldview, your gender. It doesn't matter. If you are wanting to align yourself and surrender yourself to God in flesh, that's it. End of story. You have to say, I'm all into being a Jesus follower. That's the end of story. There doesn't have to be this wide array of things that you have to do all this Jewish stuff first before you become a Jesus follower. So now there's this huge tension that is occurring over this. The formal word of how the church gathered together to, to, to come to a conclusion about this tension was this was at the council of, anybody know? Uh, not Nicaea, before Nicaea. Jerusalem. The council of Jerusalem. So this was the, the first council in which Jesus' followers came together to confront this issue head on. What do we do? This was the only meeting notes for this council. What do we do if someone wants to become a Jesus follower and they are not Jewish? Do they need to go through all this Jewish stuff in order to be all into being a Jesus follower? What's the protocol? What are the ABC steps, right? So this is, or should there be steps? Or do they just need to say, I believe? What, what, what does that look like? So this is why they all gather together to confront this. And this is where we're looking in the book of Acts, which is also written by Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke wrote one of the four gospels. And he also wrote volume two, if you want to look at it that way, of early Christianity. So he wrote the book of Acts. We are looking at chapter 15. So St. Luke records this. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. They came together to, to, to consider this matter. Pause. You got issues. I got issues. You have conflicts with other people. I have conflicts with other people. What do we do when we, when we, get, when we have conflicts? Do we go... All right, pumpkin, I think we need to get together and let's talk this out. And let's talk about what's, what, what really happened. And let me tell you what I did wrong. Let's consider this matter together. Is that what we do? When you have that issue with your spouse, with your friend, your boyfriend, your coworker, your boss, what do you do? <laughs> our go-to is not to say, hey, can we sit together and talk this out? What's our go-to? You, you, you text or you tell your coworker, can you believe what he did? Can you believe what she did? You, you want to build that resentment. You want to give it to them, Right? We, we make the wedge, the division, even more as opposed to moving in the direction of unity. But how did the church confront issues from day one to, to minimize there being divisions? They came together. And it's not like, it's not like uh, James was sitting and saying, hey, guys, let me just send a text, the group text to all the 12 apostles and tell them, hey, guys, let's meet up in Jerusalem next Tuesday. It's not like, or hey, if you can't, you can join on, join on Zoom. It's not like it was easy and convenient for them to get together. No, but they made it an issue. They made it a priority. I'm sorry. They made it a priority to come together to resolve this matter before it gets out of hand. Personally, do we do that? Or we, we, do we see there's tension, there's miscommunication. Somebody, mis, we, I misread that text, I misread that email. I, I was really offended at how that person said it. And we let that little seed grow within us. Until it gets out of hand, and every time I see that person, my blood boils. I can't stand to see that person. And, then when, and, and when you end up talking together, you realize there was miscommunication from day one. But we don't solve it when it's at day one. We allow it to get out of hand. But we see from the get-go, there was a heated discussion that was causing drama in the church. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. This is why councils in the church are a big deal. Let me just give you a little bit of history. Councils in the church, especially in the first century church, the Orthodox church, are essential because it is the councils that help us come to the table with different opinions. Let's work this out and determine what is the fullness of what the church is intended to be working synergistically with the Holy Spirit. This is why councils in the church, as you mentioned, Nicaea, Constantinople, a wide array of different councils were essential for us to understanding the fullness of the church to prevent individual parties, in the words of origin. To minimize that, councils were a big deal. This is not a first century thing. This is not a third century thing. This continues to today in some shape or form. Maybe not in a formal council and the way we look at it historically, but in this way. This is a group of God knows how many bishops of the Coptic Orthodox Church. And this is a picture taken actually just a few weeks ago. So I believe twice a year, 
bishops and he, the, the, uh, the elders, the, the succession of the apostles, hear me out on this, the succession of the apostles from the council of Jerusalem and elders, if I take this verse and I make it applicable, and I have, if there's a word picture, this is the word picture for 2022 right here. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. What's the, what's the visual of this? Boom. Here is a picture of that. The successors of the apostles and elders came together to consider matters. So here you have Italian bishops, you have bishops from America, you have from Zambia, Africa, you have Australia, you have a wide array of bishops from coming from different corners of the world, of the Coptic Orthodox Church, coming together to consider matters. Let me speak from my heart on this. There are things in the church I would love to change. I'll, I'll, forgive me, but I'll speak on your behalf. I'm sure there's things Father Mina would love for things to change in the church. There's things that our beloved bishop would love to change in the church. It's not up to him. It's not up to me. It's not up to the guy on the fourth row there on the corner either. It's when they come together to consider the matters. This is how decisions are made, working synergistically with the Holy Spirit. This is the beauty of the church. This is not Father Nathaniel's church. This is not a local Sandy Springs Orthodox church. We are part of the fullness of the church that has been passed down from the apostles and elders to where we are now. Change has to happen. Evolution has to happen. But it has to be done with so much wisdom and discernment and coming together. This is how the Holy Spirit has worked. The Holy Spirit didn't come upon uh, Mark by himself and Paul by himself. They were all gathered together in St. Mark's house for them to be empowered and convicted and for them to roll up their sleeves and be a light to the world. And it's the same message. It's the same continuity. It's the same fullness of the church that exists till today. Moving on. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, okay, I just love it. We're not trying to make it so Sunday school. They came to discuss and say, what's your opinion? What's your opinion? No, there, there was arguments, right? If you really want to look at history, if you look at some of the councils, I hate to break it to you. You, you might look at an icon of the Council of Nicaea or Constantinople, and you kind of just see everyone with a halo. The reality is that sometimes they were throwing fists. I'm not kidding. You can, you can look this up on your, but, but these, are, these are meetings. I, I hate to burst your bubble. I didn't mean to... Let's erase that. So going back, so there's councils that decide and, and they're trying to work with the Holy Spirit to determine how should the fullness of the body of the church move forward. After, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up. Peter, of course, Peter who loves to talk. Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, me, Peter, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What is Peter saying? Say, like, gentlemen, 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 come on, calm, calm down. Let, let's, you already know. You already know that God already pointed me to go and speak to the Gentiles. He's not saying it in a cocky way. He's actually pointing out something that he did a few weeks ago. He's like, you, you already know. I already told you my story. I already told you how God has appointed me to come and tell people about the good news to non-Jews. You already know that. So God, who knows the heart, he's emphasizing. This is what St. Peter is saying. God who knows the heart. Because come on, gentlemen, this is Peter speaking. You know that the, the, us to be rooted in the reality of Jesus is not an external thing. It's not a superficial thing. It's not about this or that. It's about knowing him internally in the inner life, in the heart. So he started stating the obvious. St. Peter saying this. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them, them being the non-Jews. God acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, <clears throat> purifying their hearts by faith. What is St. Peter saying? God, who knows the hearts, the same Holy Spirit, the same comforter, the, sp the same life giver in which we received a couple of months ago, not a couple of months ago, this is 16 years later, the same Holy Spirit in which we received, it's for them as well. Come on, guys. Don't draw a, land, a line in the sand and say, no, no, this is only for us and it's not for you. The same Holy Spirit which empowers us weak, insecure men to be a light to this world is the same Holy Spirit working in them. There is zero distinction between what God wants to do in us and what God wants to do in them. Do you know why? Because we are an icon of God just as much as they are. We are precious to God just as much as they are. 
Now, therefore, I love this. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples? And let's be real, which neither our fathers and not even us are able to bear. I love this. He's talking so direct, so real, and so blunt. He's not being political. What is St. Peter saying? He's saying, guys, you want them to be circumcised? It wasn't a walk in the park for us. We don't even follow all the laws as being Jews ourselves. Now you want to push this on them? Let's be real. We don't even do all the laws, and we're, we came from a Jewish background. We don't do it all. And now you want them to do it as well? Why do you want to put a yoke on their shoulders? I promise you, it's not COVID. It's just uh, allergies. It, it, why, like, we, like, we can, why do you want to put this weight on their shoulders when we can hardly handle it ourselves? He's being so real and so honest. He's not saying, no. You know, here's the rites and rituals in which they need to do if they're going to be uh, Christians. So they need to do all these 14 things. No. He says, he's being real. Why should we put this on them when we, we can hardly do it ourselves? Now, therefore, why do we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our, for, our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the, whole, of, the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Thank you, Joe. So they're saying, it's by the grace of God. You know what grace is? I think grace is, is, is a churchy word. Maybe a lot of us hear, but it's hard for us to define. You know what grace is? It's a favor in which you do not expect. Like if, if, if I plan, if I tell you I'm going to plan your surprise birthday party, it doesn't work, right? You, I, I've already spoiled it. The same thing with grace. It's a favor, a gift from God in which we do not deserve and which we do not expect. He's saying this is what drives us as being weak people. It's God's grace. It's his undeserved favor for us. It's not about do this and don't do that. We're getting lost in the weeds. It's not about the, 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 the do's and the don'ts. It's about us accepting the grace from above of Lord Jesus Christ. And I love how he words it. That we shall be saved in the same manner as they. He's putting himself under the Gentiles. He's saying, they might be saved and I might lose it because I'm being lost on the do's and don'ts. I might become so legalistic myself. I may be, I may be so stuck in the ruts of, of things that they will be saved and not me. They discuss in a very nice, gentle way, I'm assuming, and they, you know, discuss the pros and cons of what's their game plan for non-Jews to become Jesus followers. They're meeting in Jerusalem. So the head of the, the, the bishop of Jerusalem at the time, here's some history trivia for you. Anybody know who's the bishop of Jerusalem at the time? Who's kind of presiding this meeting? Anybody want to guess? Start. Huh? James, very good. So James kind of is like leading the pack here, and he puts together a formal decree, right? So just like, you know, a press release basically, right? So we need a press release of what our conclusion is of this council of Jerusalem in the year 49 AD. So he says this. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings, right? This is the, this is the top of his letterhead right here for the press release of the conclusion of their, of their meeting, right? Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law. So the pause. So he's kind of setting the introduction. He's like, we have heard that some apostles, some church leaders have come to you and have told you that, quote, you must be circumcised and you keep the law. We have heard this is the issue why we met. This is the tension. We have heard some Jesus followers, some church leaders have told you that you must be circumcised and keep the law. To whom we gave no such command. To whom we gave no such command. He's saying, we need to go back. Whatever you heard of those people saying it, uh-uh, that ain't true. Can I go on a tangent? Um, can I just say a dad joke just for the sake of Father's Day? What is the only type of car mentioned in the Bible? What type of car? Huh? A donkey? You have a, you have a donkey as a car? Okay. Huh? Honda Accord. Yeah, the word, the word Honda is not in the Bible, but definitely Accord. Yeah, yeah. So it seems, I'm just being silly. I'm just being silly. It seems, so, to whom we gave no such command. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord. All right, that's my dad joke. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord 
to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is, what is this letter, this press release from this meeting? He's saying, we, we gave no, no command that you have to be circumcised in order to become a Jesus follower, but it seemed good to us <coughs> being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying, it seemed good to us working synergistically through prayer, through fasting, through, through discernment, through wisdom, bouncing ideas back and forth, for us to be able to say, it seemed good to us that, for, uh, for, that, that, that you do not need to become circumcised, but we were in one accord. We're sending with you two people who are super legit, Barnabas and Paul, and they're going to tell you by their own mouth. They have a great resume, uh, resume of being Jesus followers, so they're totally legit. And they're going to tell you for real that you do not need to become circumcised in order to become followers of Jesus. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who have also, will also report the same thing by word of mouth. So just to make sure, this is the beauty. This is the beauty of Christianity. It's not by what I say or the bishop says or even a group of 100 plus bishops meeting in Egypt. It's not about them. It's the fullness of the church, of how it's a common thread message that gives life, that is timeless throughout the centuries. No new and no innovation, no dilution, no reduction, and the fullness that is there to be the remedy to the ache of our soul. So what is, what is the council saying? Sure, we'll send you Paul and Barnabas because their resume is super legit. I know once you see them, you'll know that they're saying, when they give you this press release, when they tell you, you'll know for sure you don't need to become circumcised. And just to give more emphasis, I'm going to make sure that same message, that truth, will also be delivered by two other guys, Judas and Silas. Not Judas uh, Iscariot, by the way. You know, he's long gone at this point. It's another Judas, which really stinks to have the name Judas, I feel, um, when he has a bad rep. But anyway, this is another apostle, and, uh, Judas and Silas. So, um, so we're going to send... Back up upon back up to make sure you understand that this is not a derivative of the way, this is not a new version of Christianity, that you are hearing the fullness of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of God. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, the, the, the press release continues, so St. James is kind of reading this decree at the end of the council meeting. For it seemed good to, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. You see the beauty? It's synergy. It's good to us using our logic, our wisdom, our discernment, our, we're using our brain together with the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to us, it seemed to, seemed, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And here he is going to list a few things that they need to follow. He, so they're saying, we're not going to lay any burden on you of, that you need to do X, Y, Z, but we're going to consolidate it and bring it down to these initial steps. If you're wanting to become a Jesus follower, here is what you need to follow. These necessary things. A, that you abstain from things offered to idols. B, from blood. C, from things strangled. And D, from sexual immorality. These four things. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Peace. So this is the end of their formal press release. So they, they had come to the conclusion, let's make it super simple. Let's not overcomplicate a relationship here. Let's bring it down to four easy steps, four easy spiritual exercises for them to take a next step to becoming Jesus followers. Let's take three things. Well, they're all four kind of related to pagan worship because a lot of them struggle with pagan worship. So, so they're, they're telling, okay, you know what? I want you to stray away from these things. So I don't want you to do these things, and I also don't, and I want you to flee away from sexual immorality. If you do these things, you will do well as far as being a Jesus follower in your first steps of being all in to Christianity. Farewell. And I want to highlight this. Out of anything, out of 634 Jewish laws, 634 Jewish laws, the conclusion of this meeting was to reduce it down to four things. Four things. Not, not four things and then three points under each one. No, four things. That's it. Why? Out of the four, they highlight for new Jesus followers to flee from sexual immorality. Why? The church is trying to guide them to regain uh, reverence and regain honor toward sexuality. Because they have used and abused sexuality. They have ripped sexuality as being just a physical thing. 
No, he's trying to tell them, no, I want you to understand the delicacy. I want you to regain the honor and holiness of sexuality. I want you to regain that. I don't want you to, I don't want you to reduce it down to porn and just about, about having sex. I don't want you to reduce it just about that. I want you to understand that the, 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 the depth and richness of what sex is designed to be impacts your physical health, your emotional health, your psychological health, your hormonal health. So I want you to regain that reverence towards sex. Yes, we live in a world where we've kind of stripped it away and it's just about having sex and that's about it. No, but it impacts the deepest part of who you are. So we need to regain that. So the church is trying to regain the beauty and holiness of sex in those who are wanting to become Jesus' followers. This is why out of the four things, one is about sexual immorality. This is why the church made a big deal to Jesus' followers. Yeah. The other three, it's all related to pagan worship. So, so they were all into pagan worship. So the, the rituals involved of being things offered to idols from blood, from things strangled. Um, but I can share more details about that later. But I wanted to highlight uh, definitely the fourth one. I have two questions. One, both should be heavy on my heart, but one is a little bit more heavy than the other. This first question is this. If the church in the first century, in the year 49 AD, were conflicted on how to make the church welcoming and loving and removing unnecessary barriers, this was the mindset of the first meeting. How are we, 2,000 years later, having that same mindset? Are you with me? If their whole mindset in the year 49 AD is how can we remove unnecessary barriers to make church easily and accessible and interesting for those who are skeptics who are wanting to come into church? That was their whole mindset. That was the driving question. How are we as a church doing that? This is the question that, 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 that is so heavy on my heart throughout the week. And this is what convicted me. And I felt God has called me into ministry because of this question. How are we making church? How are we removing unnecessary barriers for someone to take their next step toward the grace of Jesus Christ? What barriers do we put unnecessarily that make it harder for people to take a step toward the unconditional love of God? If this was the mindset of the church in the first century, what have we lost throughout the years? For us to sit there and say, nope, you got to do this, and then you got to do this, oh, and you better not do this. Right? We make it all about legalism, and we lose sight of the spirit of the first century church. But that being said, wherever you might be now in your faith journey, you need to ask yourself, what is the next step? For example, maybe you have never fasted before. Okay, fast from screen time. Put a time limit. Put a, uh, ask yourself, what is the next step for me to pursue the fullness of this first century church? Don't, this is, this is the, 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 the playbook for, for new converts. And if maybe that's you, that's totally fine. But for, for us to continue to grow, we should ask ourselves, what's my next step for me to be a Jesus follower? But as a church, what, what, what convicts me so much as a priest, what unnecessary barriers do we put that make it harder for people to take that next step toward the unconditional love of God. My second question is this, which should convict all of us is this. Maybe the first one, that's fine. Maybe it's not for you. But for those who are Jesus followers in this room, how are you called or invited to meet people where they are? The church was asking themselves, how do we meet people where they are? For those who are non-Jews, how are you meeting people where they are? Do you kind of close them off? because they don't have a similar worldview to, as you, or you don't see eye to eye, how are you meeting them where they are? This is what caused stress in the year 49 AD. How do they meet people where they are? How are we meeting people where they are? This is what should make us uncomfortable. How are we going above and beyond for that annoying person, for us to meet them where they are? If the creator of heaven and earth stripped himself down to be in the form of a human being in order to elevate us. What of us do we need to strip away, if it's our pride, 
our ego, our past, what needs to be stripped down in order for us to meet people where they are? How are you the icon of Jesus for someone else to take that first step? Or do you put unnecessary barriers for them? How do you meet people where they are? After 33 AD, it was one singular event, which is the resurrection, which changed the course of world history, which is my anchor of my worldview. And I'm inviting you to question if that is your worldview. This is what brought the inclusivity of people to, to be interested in Jesus, not drawing a line of Jesus is for this group and not that group. How are us who are Jesus followers, how are we being the hands and feet and the icon of Christ and following the same spirit of the council of Jerusalem? Let us stand for a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, it is so easy for all of us to get stuck and reduce decisions based on do's and don'ts. But Lord, I pray that this talk, that today is a reminder that we are wanting to pursue a friendship, a relationship, a union between us and you. Lord, we are so grateful that the church throughout 2,000 years has fought to preserve the fullness of the church have fought to continue to ask the question till today the church continues to meet how are we removing unnecessary barriers for people to take the full to take the step toward your unconditional love lord we pray for our church leaders the patriarchs the bishops we pray for all of them lord that your holy spirit can guide them just as your holy spirit did to the apostles and we're asking for that same holy spirit to convict us to empower us for us to continue to be your hands and feet in this world. Through the prayers of all the apostles, Lord, hear us as we all pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, and Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll continue the series next Sunday.